and comes from Corinthians, first chapter, verses 10 through 18. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but you may be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did also baptize the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be, the emptied, might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Amen. We have a little nice ticking going on up here. If you haven't noticed, we have a leak in our roof, apparently. At Christmas time, we brought out our nativity sets and told our most beloved story. It's the story we tell every year at Christmas time about the baby that was born in a stable and laid in a manger because there was no room at the inn. Poor shepherds came to visit. They were the first ones there. God wanted them there. It's a lovely, romantic story, and we love the story. But when you stop to think about it, it's great as a romantic story, but not too many of us would want to be that family in a stable giving birth to a child. We want to be in a hospital or at least at home with clean sheets on our bed. In about three months, we'll be telling another story. This is a story we don't love as much because the beginning of it makes us wince, but we tell it every year too because it gets transformed. It's the story of that precious baby who's all grown up now and how he meets his death on a cross. It's brave. It's noble. It's a story about how God is saving the world. But again, would any of us really want to live out that story? We sometimes think it asks too much, except we know the punchline. We know it changes everything. If you were casting a movie for a new superhero, would you make him or her small and weak and powerless? Not likely. Well, sometimes we do. You know, the old Superman story, he can't work if kryptonite is around, right? So, so he's big and strong and powerful, but he can be made weak. But it seems like somebody or something always comes along at the most dramatic moment when the kryptonite is sapped in him of all his powers, and it goes away, and then he saves the world. Well, Good Friday is a story about Jesus, who in many ways, the story about Jesus is written like he's kind of a superhero. The Messiah, who certainly wasn't supposed to die, at least not the death of a common criminal, for heaven's sakes. Crucifixion was a way of humiliating and shaming people. It was a way of striking terror into the hearts of everybody who saw it. It was a way of making an example of a troublemaker who was so bad and died such an awful death that you would never, ever, ever want to follow their example. No death for a superhero. But Paul says these are our stories because these are God's stories. God doesn't view the world the same way we do. What makes sense to us, what seems valuable to us, is sometimes pretty much the opposite of what God says is important. Well, this passage takes place in Corinth, and Corinth was a strip of land that divided northern and southern Greece when the Apostle Paul established a church there. 
It was a Greek city, but a lot of Jewish folks lived there, and so the culture was really sophisticated. It had Greek influence, and it had Hebrew influence. Paul had been gone for a while, and he'd received word that there were problems in the church. Divisions in it, and people were choosing sides. They were lining up behind one leader or the other and, and dividing themselves. Paul talks about that earlier in his letter to the Corinthians, but then he turns his attention to the problem of how some say the cross is foolishness. And others say they can't accept Jesus as the Messiah because of it. It is just too ridiculous to think that the Messiah God sends would be somebody dying the death of a common criminal. In Greek culture, people loved wisdom. They valued things that were wise. And some of the best philosophers were Greek. The word means lover of wisdom. For the Greeks, Paul called them Gentiles, having a crucified hero just didn't cut it. It didn't make sense. It was foolishness. And for the Jews, it was a stumbling block because their Messiah that they were expecting was not supposed to be weak or powerless. Yet Paul says those who are called to believe, both Jews and Greeks were called to believe, according to him, proclaim this very foolishness. He says, we proclaim Christ crucified, and this is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Paul points out that in the book of Isaiah, it's written that God will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Why? Because wisdom isn't always what you need to get you where you need to go. Sometimes making logical sense of th something doesn't lead you to the best answer. I remember shortly after we had our first child, someone asked Mark how much he thought the baby was costing us a year. They wanted to know if it made financial sense to have a baby. Mark thought about it for a while and said, you know, it will never make good sense to have a financial, <laughs> a financial sense to have a baby. If you wait until it makes good sense, you'll never do it, but it's worth every penny. Current studies say it costs over $245,000 or $304,000 if you adjust it for projected inflation for a middle class American family to raise a child from birth through the age of 18. It doesn't include the cost of college. It doesn't include taking off work to stay home with the child. Just imagine what your retirement account might look like if you put $245,000 into it and let it grow for 18 years. It just doesn't sound sensible, does it, to spend that money? But how do you estimate the value of love, of watching someone learn and grow and develop into a human being? who may or may not share your genes, but perhaps more importantly, share some of your values. Remember those old MasterCard ads that used to say the cost of blah, blah, blah is this, but the cost of, you know, is this? The cost of raising a child, $245,000. The value of having a child in your life, priceless. It's not only the cost involved in raising a child, the monetary cost, it's, it's the other things that come with it. If you think about all the things required in your life to raise a child, it's kind of daunting. You have to know how to keep some sense of cleanliness in the house, I guess. You have to have good organizational skills. It helps to have some medical expertise, certainly some psychological training, some talent in mediation, a sense of humor, some teaching abilities. You've got to have good physical strength, some real emotional strength, the ability to go without sleep for long periods of time, and on and on and on and on. So does it make any sense to do this at all? Who would think that they could do all those things well? You have to be a little foolish to even try. But with God's help, many of us do it, and some of us find it to be the best investment of our time and energy. Ironically, 
God's power is at its best when our power is at its lowest point. People in 12-step groups will tell you that it's only when they've hit bottom, when they've come to the worst place in their life, when they've quit trying to manage everything themselves and admitted that in some ways they are powerless, that God steps in. Of course, God's been there all along, but we notice God stepping in when we finally give up and say, I just can't do this by myself. Sometimes we have to give up our power and admit defeat to en enjoy the God who loves us and will guide us if we would just give up the reins once in a while and let God take the lead. Paul reminds the people of Corinth that they weren't all that wise and powerful or noble when he first called them together to be a church. But God can take people who are none of these things and make them wonderful sanctify them, in fact. And if we become wonderful, Paul says, it's because God did something. Not us, God did something. And so he says we're supposed to boast in the Lord, to say God is the source of our life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. I bet almost everyone in this room can remember a time when someone said, you can't possibly do that. I remember being a very little kid and I had just heard about the Guinness Book of World Records and I wanted to be in it. I thought that would be really cool to be in it. So I was thinking about how I could be in it and I, I was real little now, mind you. I had a little pencil and I took a pencil sharpener and I sharpened it more and more and more and more until it became this minuscule pencil. And I thought that maybe I had created the world's smallest pencil. And I told my mother and she said, mm, nah, I don't think that's gonna get you in the book of world records. And she said something that I know on her good days she didn't believe either, but it was a bad day apparently. And she said, you know, Diane, you're not gonna create something like that. They, everything's already been invented. Oh, what a terrible thought. You know, I, I can't do it. It's all been thought of every, uh, already. But it isn't true. It isn't true. So think back to some of those times where you thought about something you wanted to do and someone said you can't do it. You're not strong enough. You don't have enough money. You don't have the power. You don't have the wisdom. You're too big. You're too little. You're too old. You're too young. You can't do it. But I bet you if we took the time to ask, there would be all kinds of people raising their hands and saying, well, you know what? I did something that surprised me once. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, if you think about that, you did it with God's help. That God was somehow in there saying, you know what, you've got this dream, it, it resonates with my dream for you too. Let's do it. And you did. Good people working together with God can change the world and make it a better place for everybody. Good people working together with God can create a world where the hungry are fed. Statistics tell us we have the ability to feed everybody on this planet. We just aren't very good at working out how to do it. But we could. Good people have the ability, working with God, to care for sick and to set the oppressed free. These are the things that Jesus said he came to do, his mission on earth. And those of us that are following him get to follow that mission too. How do we take care of each other? How do we heal the divisions? How do we come together to make this a world where everybody can live in peace and safety? Paul says, not directly maybe, but Paul implies that God is that little voice inside that helps us to say, I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. Because with God, all things are possible. And God is all about showing the world that amazing things can be done when the weak and the powerless and the poor and the sick and the oppressed, let God work within them. Let God work within us so that the credit goes to God. We don't have to be wise in the ways of the world or stronger or better than anyone else. We just happen 
to have to be open to God's direction. And that's not foolishness. That's great wisdom. That's the source of life itself. Amen.